Uh, our next speaker is Stefan Malat. Uh, Stefan is a like, whole polytechnic in France. Uh, he's done, he, he's known for his fundamental work in wavelet theory. He also introduced a scattering transform for object recognition, and I think the work he's going to tell us about today is related to that. It's called Scattering Bricks to Build Invariance for Perception. Thanks. So, uh, I'll try to disagree with as many people as I can, so I'll med immediately begin with, uh, with Jan. Uh, so, uh, this is an example coming from Caltech, okay? I've been uh, looking a lot of these images, uh, working with them, although they're getting out, a bit out of fashion. But if you look at these images, that's a classification <laughs> problem. That's not fair, I was lo not looking. But, uh, if you look at these images, so you have 100 classes, Anchor, Joshua Tree, Beavers, and so on. There is one thing which is really immediately striking is that there is a huge variability of images within each of these classes. Now, when people tell you uh, images live in low-dimensional manifold, they always show you two things, faces and digits. Now, if you get out of faces and digits and you begin to look at that kind of images, there's no way these images belong to low-dimensional uh, uh, spaces or low-dimensional manifold. Any movement of an element of the grass is one degree of liberty. I mean, the number of degree of liberty of these images is absolutely huge. What I'm speaking here is the raw data, okay? The raw data doesn't live in a smooth manifold and not low-dimensional because too many things are moving around in these images. So the whole question then is how to deal with that. There is another thing which is obvious, is that Euclidean distance are completely meaningless when you deal with raw data. If you compute the distance between this image and this image, there is no reason why it should be any closer than between this image and this image. This is absolutely obvious. So one of the major issues is to understand how to get rid of this useless variability. And in some sense, that means how to build up informative environments. Now, invariance, that's very easy to build up. I mean, you take an image, you associate zero, you have an invariant. Obviously, the problem is to have an invariant that will be sufficient to discriminate images within any of these classes. OK, so let me come back to this issue of dimensionality. There is really a big problem when you have a signal that belongs in a very high dimensional space, let's say a million for images. The big problem is that typically any two points will be very far away one from the other. Now you can see that if you take in 1D uh, a segment like that and you want your point to be close, let's say at distance 10 minus 1, how many points do you need? Well, you need 10 points, okay? In 2D, you need 100 points. In dimension D, you will need 10 to the power D points. Now if D is a million, it's hopeless. Okay? You cannot have a lot of points that are close in dimension D. Now, of course, what you could hope is to say, again, well, but I'm not really in dimension D. I have a low dimensional manifold. And that comes back to my previous uh, comments. Now, in dimension D, the situation is really worse. I mean, if you have a point and you look at the volume of all the points which are at the distance 1, this volume is infinitely small compared to the volume of the square. That means that if all your points are in a cube like that in dimension D, they are all going to be in the corners. Now why? Because the number of corners is huge. It's 2 to the power of D. So everybody is far from everybody when you are in high dimension. And that's, again, another way to say that typically Euclidean distance will not be appropriate on raw data. OK, so this is not, of course, a, a new observation. And everybody basically knows that. This is why there is this framework of kernel learning. So what are we all doing? Take a signal x, try to build a representation which is a vector of many, let's say, features, nonlinear function of the data. And then hopefully, and that's the miracle we are expecting, a Euclidean distance on phi of x will work out. In other words, if a Euclidean distance works out, then you can even do classification with a simple linear discriminant uh, uh, classifier that will be supervised. So that means fitting a hyperplane to separate two classes. So let me just remind what it means. It means that you are just going to be able to do the classification by doing the inner product with the orthogonal vector to your uh, hyperplane. That means with linear combinations of your features. So the other element which is really important to realize is that the invariant is here. 
what you want is to build an environment through these linear combinations. The phi n effects by themselves, they are not the environments. They are the bricks from which you will build up your environment. Now, why is that very important? Because the number of classes typically is not two. There can be thousands or tens of thousands of classes. And each time you ask a new question, you want to discriminate two uh, new classes, you have to learn an element so that you can build a new invariance that will discriminate these two classes. So the whole issue is how to build up a vector which is sufficiently big so that you can build enough discriminative invariance to answer potentially any interesting question within your world. And of course what we know, and that's the topic we are all discussing about, is that it's not easy to construct this phi and the question is how to construct it. So that's the framework in which I'll be trying to, uh, to work out. OK, where we agree with Jan. There is a beautiful uh, structure that all these guys have been putting together, Hinton, Lequin, and all these uh, co-workers. And, but for me, it's a kind of computer. There is a huge variability, again, a lot of degree of freedom you can put within this big computer. And now the question is to understand what kind of configuration can help in order uh, to make this whole thing work out. So the idea again is you have an alternate, so you, you take your data, you apply a linear operator, for example, convolution with filters, and then some nonlinear operator and pooling that is going to aggregate the variable. And then a linear operator, nonlinear operator, and pooling or no pooling, and linear operator, nonlinear, boom, boom, boom. And then you get this huge potential uh, vector of features. And then you apply a linear classifier and miracle it works. There is state of the art in many of these uh, uh, very beautiful algorithms. And the other observation that everybody makes is that the first layer are basically wavelets, uh, whatever. That means that you have functions that are dilated with different orientations and uh, translation implemented with convolutions. So there has been a lot of questions uh, during the, the few talks that I'd like to summarize, and I'm, I'm going to organize my talk around these questions. So the first question is, why wavelets? What are wavelets particular? Why should we find out these wavelets, at least in these first layers? Nonlinearities. Why nonlinearities are so important, and what type of nonlinearities would like to put it? Why cascading? Why not doing a single uh, one-layer uh, structure? Role of reconstructions, that's something I'd like to comment a little bit. Role of sparsity, is really sparsity important? I, I've been working a lot on sparsity for, well, since 93 when working on dictionary and matching pursuit. And I ended up thinking that sparsity was not useful because after all, we are not here for, for compression, okay? But I'll try to show that, in fact, now I do believe, again, that sparsity is really important in this problem. And I'll try to show mathematically where it plays an imp important role. And that will be in unsupervised learning. So I'll be speaking about unsupervised learning and how we can tackle these problems uh, from a mathematical point of view also. OK, so I will be trying to do some math. And in order to do some math, you have to begin from a simple problem, as simple as possible which still carries the complexity of the issue. And I'll be beginning with the issue of translation and deformation, namely MNIST, okay? If you look at the problem of MNIST classification, the main source of variability is translations, okay? The, the figures can translate, but of course, deformation. That's what makes it difficult. And the difficulty is that you don't want to be environed to diffeomorphism. Because if you are invariant to any deformation, a 5 and a 7 are identical. So you want to learn the type of invariants. You want to have specific invariant for the 4 that you don't care about of the 5 within the 7. So the important thing here is not to build invariants to diffeomorphism, but to build bricks so that from these bricks, you can build the invariance for the diffeomorphism that you don't care about for the 4, for the 5, for the 7, and so on. There is a specific set of invariants for di each digit that you want to be invariant from because they are just intra-class variability. Now, I don't want to stay in low dimension, so I'll go in very high dimension. I will be dealing with textures, okay? And texturization of random processes which have no reasons to belong to low dimensions. And the issue of discriminating 
texture is a very old issue since very much studied since Ulege. It's about understanding stationary processes. And we know that probability have a lot of problems here because these processes are not Gaussian, they are not Markovian, they are not whatever we'd like to manipulate from a mathematical point of view, and that's the beauty of the problem. Uh, for a stationary process, yes. Yeah, stationary process. And it's yeah, stationary. Yeah, and can be very intermittent and so on, but uh, stationary. And you have deformation because, of course, your textures are on three-dimensional surfaces, so what you will observe are uh, deformed textures. Okay, so let's deal just with this problem. And what I'd like to show is that if you just want to deal with translation deformation, you are very naturally led to uh, deep structures. Okay, so what's the problem? Suppose you have a four, okay, it's an image. You translate the four with all possible translation. You have what is called the orbit of uh, your uh, function over the uh, translation group. And if you want to be invariant to translation, then you are going to map all that to one point. That's easy, many ways to do it. The problem is if your four is deformed, it's going to throw your four anywhere in your space. And these four can be very far away if you use a Euclidean distance. And what you would like is not to be invariant, but to map that in along a nice smooth manifold, as Jan and many people were saying, through this kind of nonlinear mapping. So the issue is how can we do that? Now, if you have another, and uh, now, if you can do that, why is that important? Because then you can compute the tangent space, and you can make a little projection on the orthogonal space, boom, all the points will be there. You've killed the variability with a linear operator. That's why you want to build smoothness. Smoothness is not at the beginning. You'll build it up. Now, if you have another digit, okay, you want to map it to a different point, and that's where it gets a bit difficult. All the deformorphism action will have to be mapped in the neighborhood of a nice smooth map, and then you can build an invariant, and then classification is easy. Okay, so that's what we want to do. So invariance through translation, if your signal is translated, that's easy. Uh, so you want a map which is going to map these two signals to the same point. Many ways to do it. You can use uh, registration. So you just register the, the, the two signals. That's also called the canonical invariant. Now, that's perfect, easy to do. Problem, uh, also Fourier transform. If you translate, there's just a difference of phase. You take the modulus, it's an invariant. OK, what's happening if you have a deformation? So the deformation is you can view it as a translation, but which depends upon space or time, OK? So what you want is that a small deformation should induce a small modification of phi of x measured with a Euclidean norm. So phi of x minus phi of x deform should be of the order of the size of the deformation and the classical metric of our uh, diffeomorphism is just looking at the maximum amplitude of the derivative or the gradient of tau. Okay, that's the formation metric. So you want it to be smaller than that, and you want stability relatively to additive noise. So I'll put also norm of x here. Okay, if you do that with a registration, it fails. Why? Because maybe one peak will be aligned, but the other peaks are not going to be aligned. And so the distance is going to be very far, although the deformation was small. If you use the Fourier transform, it's the same. High frequency will move very far away, and that's in fact the major issue of Fourier transform in mass for using, characterizing any uh, non-convolution operators. So Fourier transform fails. That's why nobody used Fourier transform for classification. Why wavelengths? The reason why wavelets is that if you take a wavelet and you deform a little bit of wavelet, it still looks like a wavelet. If you take a sine wave, you dilate it a little bit, it's orthogonal to a sine wave. So it's very far from the original sine wave. OK, so what is a wavelet? We spoke a lot. For me, it's basically here, just some kind of regular envelope. It can be a Gaussian, but it doesn't have to be, that I'm going to modulate with a cosine and a sine, so I get a real part and an imaginary part. The Fourier transform of my wavelet, as a consequence, will be a bandpass filter okay, of a positive frequency. If I dilate it, I get the different frequency bands. 
And what is a wavelet transform here? There is no orthogonal basis, nothing. It's just a filtering. I take the signal, I filter it with each of the wavelets, so it's like restricting its Fourier transform of a different frequency band. OK, that's the filtering. And then I keep the low frequencies, all right? And if I cover well all my frequencies with my wavelets, it's simple to show that I preserve the norm. The sum of the norm of all these functions will give me back the norm of x, OK? So that's what is a wavelet transform in 1D. In 2D, you've seen the only difference is that in 2D, I have a wavelet which is also a complex function, a Gaussian, modulated by a sine and a cosine. And then I'm going to rotate it where, like we all did it. So you rotate your wavelet, you dilate it, and you have your family of wavelets, OK? So in Fourier, I index my wavelet by the location in Fourier. That's the Fourier transform of, a, let's say, a Gabor function. You rotate it, boom, you cover the annulus. And then you dilate it, you cover all the space. So if you do that, you are going to be complete. And then you have your low frequency filter, which is at the middle. So that's the wavelet transform. It's the same. Convolution with the filter and convolution with the wavelet. And same thing, you preserve the norm. So you have an operator which is, let's say, a tight frame. OK, so what are we going to do with it? Yeah, it's the low frequency. The other ones are the, are the translation of the wavelet. Exactly, and dilation. These are the bandpass filters. Gotcha. Okay? Okay, so we'd like to build an environment with that because it's nice, a priori, it's stable to deformation. The problem, it's absolutely not translation environment. Okay? If you take a signal, you convolve it with a wavelet, you have your real imaginary part. If the signal translates, the convolution is going to be translated. So it's not at all environment to translation. Okay, you could do the same trick then Fourier, kill the phase. So if you kill the phase, you get something more regular, OK? You get the envelope. But now if x translates, the envelope is going to be translated. It's still not invariant. What could you do to make it invariant? The simplest thing to do is just to average, OK? If you average this with a window phi, then you're going to get something very regular. So if x now translates on a domain which is small relatively to the support of phi, it's going to be nearly translation invariant. If phi is equal to 1 everywhere, then the convolution here is just going to be the integral, the whole average. And that's the L1 norm. And that's, of course, invariant to translation. If x translates, this is not going to change. So you have full invariance by translation. Good. What's the problem? Oh, by the way, this is very close to SIFT, OK? This is essentially equivalent to SIFT. It's exactly daisy, right? That's yeah, it's exactly daisy, OK? That's exactly daisy, which is close to SIFT. OK, what's the problem? The problem is that you have averaged. And when you average, you lose a lot of information. Now you just have a bunch of numbers to describe a whole signal. So the whole question will be, where is the information lost? The information lost, what did we do? We took the envelope. And the envelope lose no information. You can prove that you can do phase retrieval in a stable way. So the problem is the averaging. What did you do? You averaged. So what information you lost? The high frequencies of the envelope. How could you recover the high frequency of the envelope? Well, by filter them by the wavelets. In other words, if you compute the wavelet transform of your envelope, you get your invariant, and you get the complement of information, because this is an invertible operator. OK, the problem is that this is not an invariant. So how could you make it invariant? You could kill the phase, OK, and average. Now, the good thing is that now you don't have one invariant per scale. The number of invariants is a square. You have much, much more invariant, OK? But of course, you've lost information. What, is, what did you lose? Because of the averaging. Well, let's repeat. Let's compute the wavelet transform and you get a deep convolution network. So you begin with x, you average, you apply the wavelet transform. It gives you the average and all the information loss, which is the inside layer of your network. Now, each of these is a function. For each of these, you reapply your wavelet transform. So you get the average, that's your invariance, that's the output of the network, and the next layer. For each of these, which is a convolution with any wavelet lambda 1, any wavelet lambda 2, you reapply a wavelet transform, you get your invariant and the next layer. And you just have a convolution network 
in the sense of Yan. The only difference is that here we are going to output elements at each level. What? The will take the the, of, of the different nodes. I'm going to come to that because that, that's also something that uh, you, uh, you want to do. But uh, I'm here taking the plain vanilla. I'm trying to solve the translation problem here. And this is designed for the translation problem. So that's the network output, OK? All my invariants over there, for the average, the first order, second order scattering coefficient, third order. It's like you are scattering the, your information across this network, okay? That's why we call that scattering transform. Okay, let me show you example first before giving the map. That's on audio, so this is time, frequency. These are phone notes that I'm going to make you listen if it works. And the tre that was a tremolo and the vibrato. Okay, if you compute the first order coefficient, which are very close to something which is called MFCC, in audio, uh, you know, each community rediscovers that MFCC is the equivalent of SIFT, okay? What are you doing? You are basically averaging that in time. And if you average that, they all look alike because you've destroyed the structure, the fine time variation structure of all these nodes. Now, if you look at the second layer of your network, what are you do, going to do? For any lambda one, you are going to move like that and retransform this function. And when you move like that, so here the attack was very smooth, so you have almost no energy at high frequencies. That's the convolution average as a function of lambda 2. Lambda 2 is the frequency of the second wavelength. The sharp attack, you see it appearing here, high frequency. The tremolo, you see it here. The vibrato is here. So all the structure that had disappeared here is my sec in my second family of environments. Okay, and you can continue like that. OK, so now I'm going to try to show what are the mathematical properties which are behind. There is one very important thing. Each operator that we're applying here are nonlinear operator, OK? It's contractive operators. And that's really going to be similar to works that has been done also by, uh, by um, Jean-Jacques Slotin, who studied a lot the iterations of these contract, uh, of contra nonlinear contractive operators. Here, W is a unitary operator, but absolute value, modulus, is contractive. Modulus of A minus modulus of B is smaller than modulus of A minus B, okay? It contracts. So the distance between X and X prime, where you apply this operator, is smaller than X minus X prime. So that means what you're doing, we are iterating contractive operator. If you iterate contractive operator, the whole thing is going to be contracted. The second property here is that I preserve the norm, because the modulus preserves also the norm. So the norm of x will be the norm of this plus the norm of all the next nodes. Now, each of next node is the norm of the output plus the next node, which is the norm of the output plus the next node. Now, of course, here you have a huge number of elements. But one thing you can prove is that the energy is going to go to 0 in the last layer. But well, that means that all the energy is going to get out as an environment. So you've taken your signal and you've transformed your signal into a whole family of environments. So if you consider now this vector, it's contractive and it preserves the norm. The whole information, or rather the whole energy, is captured by these environments. Finally, most important, it's stable to deformation. If you look at the distance with a stupid Euclidean norm, now it's going to be of the order of the size of the deformation multiplied by x. Why is that the case? Because the wavelets are separating scale. It's absolutely fundamental to use wavelets here to get stability to deformation. Because if you don't do a scale separation, that's where you get instability like the Fourier transform. So one reason why wavelets here are important, scale separation, stability to deformation. And now, of course, you can do classification. So let me compute, let, let me come back to SIFT. So one very simple way, uh, sorry, to digits. So this is the MNIST problem. That was Jan who told me, if you want to go into classification, the first problem you have to deal with is MNIST. So I follow. So we work with MNIST, which is indeed a beautiful test case to begin to work with. What's the dream? What you know is that even if you have two digits, let's say the one and the seven, 
they are going to, in your original Euclidean space, be all over because a one which is a little bit rotated is orthogonal to the original one, or nearly. What you dream is that once you apply your scattering transform, because they are all deformation of the one or the seven, they are now going to belong to smooth manifold that we are simply here going to approximate with a fine space. So it's a trivial classifier. And if you have a point x, you send it in your space and you classify it with the class which is the closest, oops, sorry, to, uh, to x. So, if you do that, you get state-of-the-art result on MNIST, which of course is not very interesting because nowadays you, you are working with much better, uh, much more complex data, but it shows the point. It shows that you've captured all the variability that you needed to capture and that you preserve uh, the information. The error rate is 0.4%. Uh, over MNIST. What do we learn from that? We learned that if we know a priori the type of variability we have to deal with, then we can construct the filters. And essentially, the way to construct the filters are building wavelets on the group. I'll generalize that from translation to any other groups. Let me before go to, yeah. No, no, it's the same wavelets, and we use only two layers. And it absolutely doesn't depend whether we choose a Gabor wavelet, a cubic spline, or whatever. This is very robust to the choice of wavelets. We get exactly the same classification rate when we change. What is important, however, is to have a complex wavelet. This is really important for the property when you take the modulus. Uh, stationary processes. Let's now look at problems like texture. So suppose you have a stationary process X, and you apply your scattering transform. So you make convolution, filtering, modulus. It's going to stay stationary. So now each of these outputs are stationary processes. However, what are you doing? You are averaging. When you have a stationary process, and you average it on a very long domain with a little bit of ergodicity property, that's going to converge to the mean. Okay? So all these numbers will be very close to expected value. And so I'm going to introduce this expected scattering mo uh, transform. It's just the family of expected value of all these numbers, OK? Now, if this x is a random process, these are real numbers. It's exactly like saying, I take a random process, I characterize it with first order moment, second order moment, first order moment. Well, these are scattering moments, OK? That's what I'm going to use. Now, you can analyze the property of these moments. They are essentially the same than previously. What I want is rather to show you examples. These two images are identical from the point of view of moments, second order moments. They have same second order moments, same power spectrum. First order scattering coefficients are identical because they are very close, in fact, to an averaging of the power spectrum. Second order coefficient, completely different because the sparsity of this image and this image in the wavelet domain, the geometry of the singularities is totally different, and that's captured by the second order moments, the second order scattering coefficients. Let me show you sounds. So these two sounds are, have the same second order moments, OK? Same thing, first order scattering coefficients, so the output of the first layer of the network is identical. The second layer will be very different because you have these intermittent structure in this cell. OK, can you reconstruct in the sense of stochastic process? So what does it mean? You have a family of expected value, which are a family of expected value of some nonlinear function of your random process. Okay? Now, how can you reconstruct? What you really are having, these expected values are just the inner product of your probability distribution with each of these functions, um of x. So the standard way to reconstruct is to reconstruct the p of x of maximum entropy under this condition. And if you apply your Lagrange multiplier, you have the Boltzmann theorem, which tells you that p of x has a Gibbs energy, which is just the linear combination of these um of x. And in my case, the um of x are these successive convolution modulus. Okay? So let's see what that's doing, and that's the work of Joachim Menden and uh, also Joanne Bruna. 
I'm going to compare. That's the textures uh, provided by uh, Josh McDemos, the original texture. What you get with a Gaussian model, keeping the n power spectrum coefficient or all the covariance information, and just keeping the log n squared divided by two first and second order moments of scattering moments. Oop. Gaussian model. The water. not good for everything okay why so the discussion about reconstruction here we are not reconstructing the signal okay what we're reconstructing its time is completely different from the signal but it's a realization of a similar random process so we perceive it similarly why is reconstruction here interesting at least from a tool point of view is that you see if you are capturing the essential information for the classification problems and it's easy to construct uh, signals Random processes which don't work with that kind of thing, okay, when you, when you understand the map, and that allows you to understand what is failing within your representation for classification uh, uh, problems. Okay, so classification of textures. It, we really have here the state of the art on all the textures that I know, all the databases textures uh, that I know. If you apply a Fourier spectrum or there has been a lot of uh, algorithm. You get about 1% error on uh, this QRT database that was put together by Malik at uh, Berkeley. The error goes by a factor of five down, 0.2%. Why? Because when you have texture having same second order moments, basically Fourier transform is blind. And any wavelet energy will be blind to it. When you go to the second layer, you, you capture it. 